So today I want to start by um, saying Happy New Year to everyone. And I also want to say bye-bye to 2020. And I'm sure everyone out there has the same sentiment that I have about um, this past year that went by, this crazy year, this insane year. So bye-bye 2020. Happy New Year to you all. In the previous video, I asked a very simple question. How come quantum mechanics or the main equations associated with quantum mechanics are written in terms of energy and momentum instead of in terms of force and power? And then uh, I went on to rewrite these two equations in terms of power and force and I also, uh, and for the de Broglie relation, I, I further rewrote that uh, so that it is in the frequency domain. Okay, so this is how I do quantum mechanics. So just for clarity, the only thing that changes with these two equations from the original, so let's look at these two, the only thing that changes are the units. Okay, the output of these two equations, when written like this, are exactly the same. So the values that get generated from this, this equation, these two equations are exactly the same as you would get from these two equations. Uh, the only thing that changes is the unit analysis. And so uh, these two equations appear in my specification as uh, this the power equation here where power equals the quantum of energy Planck's constant times the frequency of the uh, of whatever it is we're looking at in this case it would be light and um, so the momentum equation is a force equation and so force is equal to the quantum of momentum which is Planck's constant divided by the speed of light and um, times the frequency. And so, uh, and these are my quantum constants. And wh what we're gonna do today is we're going to apply this specification to, uh, to a real life problem. And I've done this before, but I'm gonna do it again. And now I'm going to reference my specification. Now, for clarity, I want to point out uh, that um, when I was going through my code, I was writing my code, which I'm going to show you, I discovered a little, uh, a little um, error in my, in my numerology, I'm gonna call it my numbers. And it's just a tiny error, but uh, I recalculated my constants. And so um, it starts with, of course, Planck's constant is only really valid up to this many decimal places. And this is what I was writing before. So before I was writing um, 6.626069, and now I'm writing 6.626715. This is the number that appears in the NIST standard. And since all of my other constants are calculated using uh, Planck, this value, I had to recalculate uh, these values. So these values are a little bit different, but only to this decimal to the point zero, 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 zero here. So the, the difference is really way past any, any, um, any uh, digits of precision that we would require. But uh, being a computer science scientist, I am uh, a little bit, uh, let's say, anal retentive about my uh, getting the exact values. So here the quantum of uh, potential, the quantum of mass, if you want to call it, is also a little bit different at this decimal place here. And so these are the values uh, that I'm going to use. Of course, this is the reason I call this a specification is because uh, specifications are subject to change. Okay, this is not hard coded. Okay, so uh, as a computer scientist, I like to have a specification and from the specification, I write the code. And as I'm writing the code, if I find a mistake, then I feed that back into the specification. So that's basically what I've done here. And so I've got some uh, new values that I believe are more accurate than the values that I had uh, previously. So in, in this video, I'm going to apply this specification to a, uh, a couple of real life examples. I'm going to apply it. I'm going to implement it and, um, and write the code. And then of course, 
uh, I will make that chunk of code available. And it's really simple. This is not rocket science. This is actually, you know, the opposite of rocket science. But um, so here is the problem. We've done this before, but we're going to do it again. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that I am, instead of referring to this as quantum mechanics, I am now going to be referring to it as oscillation mechanics. Okay, oscillation mechanics. Because um, as you may remember, in modified unit analysis, I added a domain of oscillation to the unit section, and then I reworked the unit, unit section of, uh, of the quantum mechanics equations using uh, placing these delta terms where I feel they, that they're necessary and belong in the unit analysis. So because I'm calling this do, the domain of oscillation, I'm now going to uh, refer to when I apply this, when I apply this, my specification, I am going to refer to it as oscillation mechanics. So here is the question, here is the problem that we're going to solve, and here is the code that I use to solve this problem. So the, uh, the, the problem is, the question is, given A, an 0.1, sorry, 0.516 watt laser emitting light with a wavelength of 726 nanometers, what force would the light emitted by such a laser exert on an, on an external object? So this is a simple physics problem, which can be easily solved uh, by taking the power and dividing by the speed of light and you get the force. But uh, that doesn't give you any intuition whatsoever about um, what is going on sort of under the hood. So, uh, so this is uh, my implementation of this problem in a little piece of code. So the first two lines of code are the, um, the constants that we know, that are measured, that are defined in the, um, in, the, in the standard, the NIST standard. And so we have the speed of light, which is exact. It is um, 299,792,458 meters per second. And then we have the quantum of energy, which is numerically equal to Planck's constant. And this is the value from the NIST standard, uh, 6.62607015 times 10 to the minus 34. And in modified unit analysis, this constant has the units of joules per cycle. And then the, the rest of the uh, parameters are calculated. And so we have the speed of light squared, which is used quite often. So I just calculate that. Obviously, that is C times C. And uh, the reason I'm writing this down is so that I can show you the units. And the units of the speed of light squared are the units of emission and absorption. So meters per second times meters per second are actually the units of emission and absorption and of course emission and absorption are related to energy and this is this is why um, you know the units of energy the, the, this is actually in the units of energy the units of energy are a kilogram meters per second meters per second these are the units of emission and absorption so I just I wrote that in I need to I need this parameter I need this constant but I also wanted to write the units So then I go on to calculate the other two quantum constants that you find in my specification. So uh, these two quantum constants here are calculated. And so uh, the quantum of momentum, which I actually call the quantum of kinetic inertia. So momentum is kinetic inertia in my, uh, in my line of thinking. And so the quantum of momentum, uh, I use the word momentum just because that's what mainstream uses and I want to try and connect what I'm doing to mainstream physics. And so the quanta, um, quantum of momentum is the quantum of energy, Planck's constant, divided by the speed of light. And the quantum of mass is the quantum of energy, Planck's constant, divided by the speed of light squared. And this, of course, is equals mc squared. Okay, so E equals mass times the speed of light squared. So that's where this value comes from. And so there's, there's no big mystery here. 
the, the only constants we really know that we can measure are the speed of light, and we can intuit um, Planck's constant, quantum of energy, via experiments. And so these values are actually experimentally um, found. And so now we have everything we need to solve this problem. So the next thing I do is I take the 726 nanometers and because I do everything in the uh, domain of oscillation, in the frequency domain, I need to convert to frequency. So uh, 276 nanometers is 2.76 times 10 to the minus 7 um, meters per cycle. Okay, wavelength has units meters per cycle in modified unit, modified unit analysis. And when you convert from nanometers to meters, it's in the order of 10 to the minus 7. And so I need to do everything in standard units, so I need to convert this to meters. Now I can use the speed of light to convert this to uh, the frequency. And so the frequency of a 2 point uh, or a 726 nanometer wavelength, meters per cycle, of uh, light uh, has the value of 4.1293, etc., times 10 to the 14. Okay, so that is 4.12 times 10 to the 14th is 4 with 14 zeros. So this would be, you know, 400 trillion, 400 trillion cycles per second. Just think about that for a second. 400 trillion cycles per second. That is the uh, frequency per second of a 726 nanometer uh, wavelength of light. So next what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the force and the power of this frequency of light using the uh, these two equations from my specification. So this is the power equation and this is the force equation. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to calculate the force of, the, of this wavelength of light, which has a frequency in the order of 10 to the 14 or 400 trillion cycles per second. So when I take that frequency and multiply that by the quantum of momentum, I get the force. And when I take that frequency and I multiply it by the quantum of energy, I get the power of that frequency of light. Okay, so this is the force and the power of the light that hasn't been amplified. So this is before amplification. This is before laserization. Okay, so this is an important point. So I've just calculated uh, using my quantum equations, using my um, do, uh, oscillation mechanics, if you want to call it that. That's what I want to call it. Uh, I calculated the force and the power. And so now I'm going to use these two um, calculations to calculate the force of the amplified signal. So we know that the power of the laser is 0.516 watts. And so um, the laser power is 0.516 uh, 516 watts. And so to calculate, so what I want to do now is I want to calculate the amplification of this laser signal. Okay, so the laser is 0.516 watts. Uh, the, the power, I just calculated the power of this wavelength of light, of this frequency of light. I calculated the power before being amplified. And so to calculate the amplification, I take the laser power and divide it by the power that I calculated, and I end up with a amplification factor. And this is uh, turns out to be 1.8858, etc., times 10 to the 18. Okay, so this is an amplif amplification factor of uh, in the order of 10 to the 18. That's you know one with 18 zeros past it. That is a big number. Okay, so this is the amplification factor of the laser, which explains why lasers are super powerful, okay, compared to light that isn't amplified. And so 
then it's quite trivial to calculate the force. So previously I calculated the force. Um, I, this is the force that the light would, um, would have on an object, an external object. Uh, this is the force that a light would exert on an external object uh, without being amplified. And so when I multiply this force by the amplification factor that I just calculated, you get the force of the laser, which is in with my code here, it is 1.7211 um, times 10 to the minus nine. And the actual value is 1.7119 times 10 to the minus nine. So I get the correct value when I do when I do my calculations um, using oscillation mechanics, using uh, modified unit analysis and oscillation mechanics. And so that is how I do it. This is essentially a, a proof. It is a proof that my line of thinking is, uh, is consistent. Okay, it is logical the way I implemented this, the way I, um, the way I calculated this is there's a logical progression that makes sense, that is easy to understand. And so it is my opinion that um, these two equations, these two equations from quantum mechanics, although they're historically written in terms of energy and momentum, um, should have been and could have been just as easily written as a power equation and as a force equation. Because in my code here, I actually used those equations, but I called them power and force. I used them as power and force in uh, the calculation of the force that this laser would have on an external object, and I get the right answer. And so uh, again, this is a kind of a proof. It's a proof that my line of thinking works, that this line of thinking is uh, valid and consistent and logical. I'm a computer scientist. I like logic. And to me, this is logical. So next, we're going to use oscillation mechanics to, to solve the photoelectric effect. Now, it is well known that when you supply uh, different frequencies of light to a, a material, to a metal, that the um, uh, below a certain frequency, the electron cannot be ejected from the material, but above a certain threshold, the electron can be ejected. And so... Um, we have here a setup where we have potassium. Now, it, potassium re requires two electron volts to eject an electron from the medium, from the material, and so uh, this is the setup we're going to be we're going to be using. The red light is 700 nanometers, which is 1.77 electron volts. The, um, the green light is uh, reported to be 550 nanometers and 2.25 electron volts. And the blue light, the purple light, here it's in purple, is uh, 400 nanometers and, uh, and or can be expressed in terms of electron volts as 3.1 electron volts. And the uh, three velocities are calculated the red, uh, with the red light, there's no electrons with the green light there is um, the electron is ejected with a certain velocity and with the the blue light it is ejected with a certain velocity and the velocities are calculated here and so we're going to use oscillation mechanics to um, to calculate these velocities and this is act turns out to be actually super simple it's actually much simpler than the previous problem that we just solved um, but now we have three wavelengths of light that we need to address. And so here's the code that I set up to do the calculations for, for these um, three situations. And so first of all, um, these wavelengths of light, these frequencies of light, these energies of light are reported in terms of both wavelength 
and electron volt. And so I'm going to use uh, electron volt to calculate the frequency. And so I know I can do that from the energy. And so uh, electron volt is just another way of expressing energy. And the conversion factor from um, electron volt to joule is uh, this calculation here. So each electron volt is 1.021, etc., times 10 to the min minus 19 joules, joule per electron volt. So to convert from joule to electron volt, I multiply by this factor here. And so here, as you see, potassium requires two electron volts to eject an electron, at least two electron volts. So I calc and that is the binding energy. You can think of that as the binding energy to the potassium. So to unbind an electron, you need at least two electron volts. And so I'm going to calculate, first I'm going to calculate the binding energy of potassium by multiplying 2 by electron volt to get the energy of the binding energy, which is 3.204, etc., times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So this is the energy you need to supply to the potassium to get an to knock an electron out of the system. And so then I move on to, so then I use, um, you know, the quantum of energy to calculate the frequency. So the binding frequency, the frequency equivalent of the binding energy is the binding energy divided by the quantum of energy, aka Planck's constant. And so when I do that, I get 4.83597, etc., times 10 to the 14 cycles per second. Okay, so that is super fast. That is, you know, uh, 400 trillion, 400 trillion, as we talked about before, that's a fast frequency, 400 trillion cycles per second. Okay, cycles per second. So that's how many, many times a, um, uh, the, this energy that can knock an electron out of potassium, this is how many oscillations per second it must have to, uh, to resonate the uh, electron out of the system. So next we're going to convert these, two, these three wavelengths to the frequency domain. And because I previously used electron volt to calculate the binding energy, I'm going to use the electron volt parameters here. So I'm going to use 1.77 electron volts for the red light, 2.25 electron volts for the green light, and 400 or sorry, 3.1 electron volts for the um, the blue light. And so this is what I'm doing right here. So the red frequency. So first I need to convert from electron volt to joules, so I multiply the, um, the electron volt by the conversion factor, and then I divide by the quantum of energy to get the frequency. So uh, the, all three frequencies are the, in the order of 10 to the 14 cycles per second. Okay, the red light is 4.27 times 10 to the 14th. The green light is 5.44 times 10 to the 14th and the blue frequency is 7.49 times 10 to the 14th. And so this is uh, 400 trillion cycles per second. This is 544 trillion cycles per second. And this is 749 trillion cycles per second. This is how often this light is oscillating per second. And I really can't overemphasize this point because this is the point that um, that me and others are arguing that light is on a per second basis. So, uh, so these are the three frequencies for the red, the green, and the blue. So now what we want to do is we want to find out what is the difference between the frequencies of each of these, um, these light um, waves. Okay, we want to figure out what's the difference between the frequency and the binding frequency, because before, previously we calculated the binding frequency of the electron to the potassium, and now what we want to find out um, what happens when we apply these three frequencies to the material. And so 
what we do is we what I do is I calculate the difference between the frequency that I just calculated and the binding frequency. So I subtract the binding frequency from the, the three frequencies and this is what you end up with. So you see that the difference in frequency for the red light is negative. Okay, so the red light does not eject an electron from the potassium and this explains why because the, fre it's the frequency is not high enough to, uh, to knock an electron out of the potassium. And so uh, that explains that. And so then uh, when you calculate the difference between the green frequency and the binding energy, you get a positive number. And so this is the value that you get, 6.04, etc. times 10 to the 13th cycles per second. So that is the difference in frequency. That's a frequency difference. And the blue frequency difference is 6, 2.5. 65 etc times 10 to the 14th cycles per second okay so this is the frequency difference so you need at least the binding frequency you need at least the binding frequency to knock an electron off but if you supply a higher frequency then what happens is the electron gets knocked out of the potassium at a certain velocity and this is what we're trying to calculate here so how do we get velocity out of um, from the frequency domain? How can we get a, a velocity when we're only using frequencies? Now here's where it gets interesting. And here's where I get to use my quantum of mass parameter. Okay, so the this is where I get to use this the concept of the quantum of of potential uh, inertia, and so. Uh, it is well known that the rest, the rest mass of the electron is 9.109, etc., times 10 to the power of minus 31. That is the mass of the electron. And so to calculate the frequency, which I did before in a previous video, uh, it's basically the Compton frequency. Okay, to calculate the Compton frequency, frequency of the particle, we divide by the quantum of mass. And of course, the quantum of mass I already calculated in the previous um, chunk of code. And so here it is the quantum of energy divided by the speed of light squared. And so when I do that, I get an electron frequency uh, of 1.2355, etc., times 10 to the 20 cycles per second. That is, um, you know, one with 20 zeros. So this is orders of magnitude higher frequency than the light that is hitting it. And so, um, so this is the potential inertia of the electron. Okay, so, so how do we get velocity? How do we know what velocity this electron is gonna get um, knocked out of this material, the maximum velocity. Okay, it's a max velocity. So if it gets a direct hit, this is the maximum velocity that we're going to calculate. So whatever calculation I do, I know that the units have to end up in uh, being meters per second, being the units of velocity. And so um, in order, and we're talking about kinetic, en kinetic energy here, we're converting from the potential energy the potential inertia of the electron which is not in motion, which is not in motion when it is uh, bound to the potassium material, the medium. Um, so uh, we're converting from potential to kinetic energy. And so basically I use the, you know, kinetic energy equals one half mv squared and I rearranged it and this is the calculation to calculate the velocity. And so it's the square root of two times the quantum of energy over the quantum of mass. Now this is basically the speed of light squared. Okay, I could have plugged in the speed of light squared here, but I want to show you where that speed of light squared comes from. And so uh, this uh, speed of light squared, when you take the square root of the speed of light squared, of course you end up with the speed of light, you end up with meters per second, which is what we want. And then what we do is we take the, the difference frequency, so this is the frequency minus the binding energy, 
and if the, fr the frequency is higher than the binding energy, you get a positive number. If the frequency is less than the binding energy, you get a negative number. And so for the red velocity, uh, to calculate the red velocity, I end up plugging in a negative number into this equation and take the square root of that. And of course, the computer does not like that. And so that, you know, gives an invalid number. You can't take the square root of a negative number. This is an invalid number. Uh, technically, what that means is the red light is not going to knock the electron out of the potassium. And then, so for the green velocity, I use this calculation and I get uh, 2.9654, blah, 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 times 10 to the fifth. And that, in fact, is the value they, uh, they give here, 2.96. Of course, I have way more digits of precision than they do, but that's okay. 2.96 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And when I do the same with the blue velocity, when I use this equation to calculate the velocity, I get 6.2204, etc., times 10 to the fifth. And the value they report, of course, is 6.22 times 10 to the fifth. So uh, using oscillation mechanics and modified unit analysis, I'm able to uh, calculate the velocity uh, completely in the context of the frequency domain, of the domain of oscillation. And so, and, and it, you can clearly see when you get a pause, when, you, when the difference between the binding energy and the, uh, the uh, frequency of light is, is greater than one is a positive number, then the electron is going to get emitted with a maximum velocity of what I calculate here. The other important point I want to make here is that um, the process of conversion from electron volts to wavelength to frequency to joule, so, uh, you know, in practice there are, are often a lot of conversions from one uh, domain to another domain, and so my approach uh, to oscillation mechanics where I convert everything to the frequency domain and keep all the decimals uh, digits of precision is that if I then I do all the math in the frequency domain and uh, then I can convert back to energy if I need energy. I can convert back to, you know, I can convert to velocity if I need velocity, um, and I can convert back to mass if I need mass, and I can convert, you know, back to momentum if I need momentum or force or power. And so the idea is to get everything into the frequency domain as quickly as possible right at the beginning. I take everything and convert to the frequency domain. I do my calculations in the frequency of domain, and, um, and then, you know, I keep all the digits of precision. And so this, you're not going to lose any digits of precision by converting from one domain to another domain. And here's an example, a good example right here. In this example, um, they have the green as 2.25 electron volts. And they say, well, okay, so that's 550 nanometers. But in reality, it's 551 nanometers. And so I originally did my calculations in the, uh, by converting wavelength to frequency, which is, which is easy. You just, you know, speed of light divided by wavelength is frequency, but this did not give me the right answer for the velocity. It gave me uh, 2.99 when I used 550. And so when I back out calculated using 2.25 electron volts, I discovered that um, it's actually 551 nanometers. So if I had used 551 nanometers, I would have gotten this answer 2.96. And so converting back and forth from wavelength to electron volt to joule to, you know, uh, there are going to be errors in those conversions. And so the uh, use of the of oscillation mechanics, converting everything to the frequency domain, to the domain of oscillation, and then doing all your calculations, which I proved here that um, you can do at least for these two situations and probably for all situations, you could uh, do your calculations in the frequency domain and then convert back to, so if you have a, uh, if you want the red shift, you would, you know, convert the, you know, the frequency to, to um, wavelength, if you want wavelength, uh, that sort of thing. And so, 
Um, so that is, I think there's an advantage to doing quantum mechanics in terms of oscillation mechanics and not worrying so much about the physicality of it because um, as Nikola Tesla said, you know, if you want to understand the, you know, nature of the universe, think in terms of frequency. And so this, you know, whole approach to uh, converting to the frequency domain is based on Nikola Tesla's philosophy that everything is frequency. So why not do everything in the frequency domain? So that is, um, that is justification, I think, for the approach that I'm taking. And, I, you know, I'm going to, again, find other examples and um, see how, how um, widely this could be applied. So that's about it for this example. The main point I wanted to make is that um, my approach to uh, quantum mechanics, if you want to call it that, but I'm calling it oscillation mechanics, is self-consistent. It's logical, it's super simple, at least I think it's simple, uh, especially in terms of the code. Once you start writing the code, it is super, super simple. And the other point I wanna make is that all of the, in these two examples I gave you, I used all of these quantum constants, okay? I used all of these quantum constants in order to uh, do the calculations. And so in the photoelectric effect, I use the quantum of mass to calculate the electron frequency. So this puts um, the frequency of uh, particles in the, uh, in the oscillation domain. So even particles uh, have frequency and I can actually use that frequency to, um, to do calculations that make sense. So I was, I was able to use the electron frequency to calculate the correct velocity that an electron would be emitted at if it was hit with that frequency of light. And so uh, I find this really interesting. It is um, self-consistent. The system that I've developed here, not only is it super simple, but it's self-consistent and it is logical and it gives me the right answer. And the answers that I get are to many, 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 many decimal places. I like this, I'm a computer scientist. The more decimal places I have, the better. I'm not sure how accurate these are uh, as far as digits of precision. Okay, I've got, I have lots of digits of precision, but that they may only be accurate to five or six or seven or 10 digits, maybe not to all 14, 15, 16 digits. But regardless, uh, this is as accurate as you can get. And so this is why one of the reasons I like this approach is I get uh, super, super accuracy to as many decimal places of precision as I'm given. And the limit is really, the limit is um, how these two parameters are calibrated. So the limit is the speed of light, which is exact, okay? And the other limit is Planck's constant, which may or may not be exact. And so that I'm, I'm uh, my, Accuracy is limited by these two parameters in my system. And so, uh, so that's about it. Um, I really hope that you are getting what uh, the point I'm trying to make here. And I will continue to plug away at this and see if I can find more examples that I can apply this to. I think this could be applied to Compton scattering. That'll be my next maybe attempt to apply this to Compton scattering. In fact, the photoelectric effect is very much like Compton scattering in that you have light of a certain frequency causing an electron to, uh, to move, to uh, have uh, momentum, kinetic momentum. And so this is the beginnings of Compton scattering. So that's it for now. Um, again, Happy New Year. 2021 it, it can't get much worse than last year and so uh, I'm going to continue to move forward with my research and um, I'm going to try to enjoy this year so thank you very much and um, I'll be back